This program was made possible by a grant from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. When I was a child growing up in New York, my mother would suggest that we visit the Statue of Liberty, and I declined. It wasn't interesting to me because it was right there. Well, how about the UN? Well, that was right there, too. So I turned down the opportunity to visit these places because they were always there. Bob Bohm is a major player in this debate, this great dialogue that engages the nation right now. His biography, which you have in the program, includes several books and countless articles. What makes him most remarkable is that he's one of the few abolitionists who tries, fails, but tries, <laughs> to give a balanced account when he deals with the death penalty. And I respect him enormously for that. Now, I just wanted to tell you what we intend to do tonight. You've heard it's going to be a debate. Partly it's going to be a debate, and partly it's going to be a dialogue and a dialectic, which as Socrates distinguished from a debate, was not so much two minds trying to best each other, but two minds focused on the truth, trying to get closer and closer to it. The structure is this as we envision it. He will open and rebut for a combined time of no more than 30 minutes. I will respond to his opening and rebut for a combined time of about 20 minutes. Now, you might ask, why should I have less time than he does? And the real reason is, of course, because I represent the truth, and so I don't need as long to, to do it. <laughs> in, in any case, that, that's the structure of it. And it should go a little bit, uh, about two hours. I am happy to stay afterwards if we haven't completed what you want and you're still interested in seeing some more stuff or talking about it. But I urge you, in closing, first of all, I urge him not to count this time against me, which if he does, then I retract everything I s said about him and urge you to boy boycott his classes, don't read his writings. But, <laughs> but otherwise, just to open it up, I, I, I really urge you not to make the mistake I made. Just because it's close at hand, just because it's there, doesn't mean it's not worth taking advantage of. Bob Bohm is a leading player in this dialogue. Use him wisely. Expose yourself to his perspective. Reject it in the end, but expose yourself. <laughs> Well, I'd like to th uh, thank Professor Blecker and uh, Professors uh, uh, Grissett and Dorner for their uh, gracious uh, introductions. Um, as uh, Professor Blecker noted, that in my classes I do try to present both sides of the uh, debate as uh, best I can, uh, recognizing that uh, it's impossible to uh, uh, be unbiased about uh, any issue. Uh, tonight, I'm not going to attempt to be uh, unbiased. Uh, I am going to uh, forthrightly uh, argue against the death penalty. And let me see if I can, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, press computer, thank you. Okay, let's see, go back. There we go. I hope everybody can see that with the light shining. There's also two screens on the sides as well. Uh, my contention tonight uh, is that um, there really is no good reason to support the death penalty, and there are many reasons to oppose it. And in the limited time that I have tonight, I want to briefly go over uh, many of the reasons why one should oppose uh, the death penalty. Now, because of time limitations, I cannot go into the depth that I would like to. Uh, students of my classes have been privy to uh, uh, more of the uh, in-depth material. Uh, but tonight, I'm just going to raise uh, a variety of issues, and that if you want, uh, during the question and answer period, I'll be happy to elaborate 
on any of these issues. So to begin, my uh, first reason to oppose the death penalty is that there is absolutely no evidence that the death penalty has a marginal deterrent effect. In other words, there is no evidence that shows that the death penalty prevents uh, capital murders or for that matter any other crimes more than an alternative uh, punishment such as life without opportunity of parole or other uh, harsh punishments. A second reason to oppose the death penalty is that the death penalty may have a counter deterrent or brutalizing effect. In other words, the death penalty may actually cause murders. You might ask, how so? Um, one way is through the suicide murder syndrome that is attested to by uh, psychiatrists. Uh, here is an individual who wants to commit suicide, uh, is unable for whatever reason, and therefore commits a capital murder so the state can put that person to death. Another reason is the executioner syndrome. This refers to the situation where a murderer believes that he or she has a good reason to kill, that he or she is essentially doing a public service by committing the murder. A third reason is the pathological de desire to die by execution. Uh, there are people for whatever reason who want to die by execution. That's probably related to the fourth reason, and that is to gain the attention and notoriety that an execution might bring the person. Um, we know of some people, uh, Ted Bundy, um, uh, <laughs> Timothy McVeigh, um, and a variety of other people simply because they had been executed. If these murderers, or most murderers that we know about, had been sentenced to a long term of imprisonment, we probably wouldn't know their names. Um, and so the death penalty does provide uh, some people uh, notoriety uh, that they would not have received otherwise. And finally, a last way that uh, uh, capital punishment might have a counter deterrent or brutalizing effect is by the diversion of attention and resources for alternative ways of dealing with violent crime. As I'll note in a few moments, the death penalty as administered in this country is incredibly expensive. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on capital punishment that in the absence of this penalty could be spent on more effective ways of dealing with the violent crime problem. A reason number three to oppose the death penalty. The death penalty costs significantly more than LWOP, which means life imprisonment without opportunity or of parole, or, or any other punishment that might be imposed. Uh, just a few facts. The average cost per execution in the United States is estimated to be between two and a half and five million dollars per execution, and that's in two thousand uh, dollars. If we were to calculate it for the year 2007, it would be um, slightly higher. Now, I'm referring to the entire capital punishment process, not simply the execution, which in and of itself is relatively inexpensive. Now, extraordinary cases can cost much more. For example,
The state of Florida reportedly spent $10 million to execute serial murderer Ted Bundy in 1989. Orange, Cal uh, Orange County, California spent more than $10 million just to convict serial killer Randy Kraft in 1989. Kraft is now uh, consuming more of California's resources uh, while uh, waiting his execution on death row. Finally, the United States government spent more than $100 million to execute Timothy McVeigh in 2001. Now, a life sentence, uh, meaning approximately 40 years in prison, uh, on the other hand, uh, was estimated to cost about a million dollars, and that includes uh, the extra money that would be spent uh, as the uh, offender aged and required uh, more medical attention. Now, recent evidence from Kansas uh, indicates that a death penalty trial, at least in Kansas, uh, cost about 16 times more than a non-capital uh, murder trial. About 30 or $35,000 for the uh, non-capital death penalty trial, uh, uh, somewhere over $500,000 for the death penalty trial in the state of Kansas. Uh, that same study showed that the uh, death penalty appeals in Kansas cost about 20 21 times uh, more than appeals in uh, non-capital uh, murder cases, to give you some idea of uh, where the extended costs are. I don't know what to point this thing to. So. <laughs> now, the costs of a death sentence The cost of a death sentence will probably always be more expensive than the cost uh, of an LWOP sentence because super due process is required uh, only in capital cases. Super due process refers to the special procedures that are required only in death penalty cases. They include uh, guided discretion statutes uh, with aggravating and mitigating factors, bifurcated or two-stage uh, trials, guilt phase and penalty phase, automatic appellate review, and in some cases, proportionality review. Another consideration is that death penalty costs are accrued up front, especially at trial and for the early appeals while life in prison costs are spread over many decades. A million dollars spent today is a lot more costly to the state than a million dollars that can be uh, spent gradually over 40 years. Finally, it should be remembered that whenever a capital trial does not result in a death sentence and execution, the added costs uh, associated with the death penalty process have been incurred without any return on the state's investment of resources. A good example is New Jersey that has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on death penalty cases and has yet to execute anyone under post Furman statutes or since the death penalty resumed in 1976. A fourth reason to oppose the death penalty. The death penalty consumes an inordinate amount of the resources of the federal courts, especially the Supreme Court. A fifth reason. The death penalty is imposed in an uh, impermissibly arbitrary way. For example, the death penalty actually is nothing more than a lottery. Only one to two percent of all death eligible offenders are ever executed. 
And furthermore, there is no meaningful way to distinguish between death-eligible offenders who are executed and death-eligible offenders who are not executed. Um, now, some people, I think my uh, distinguished uh, colleague, Dr. Blacker, argues that the death penalty should be reserved for the worst um, of the worst. Uh, death eligible offenders. Now, assuming that one could distinguish who uh, among all those that are death eligible is in fact the worst of the worst, the fact of the matter is that we don't execute arguably the worst of the worst anyway. Um, take for example the case of Gary Ridgway, the so-called Green River a killer uh, who in 19, uh, um, excuse me, who in 2003 admitted to killing 48 women uh, during a span of two decades. Uh, Ridgway was allowed to escape the death penalty by uh, pleading guilty to the murders and in doing so gained the distinction of pleading guilty to more murders than any other serial killer in American history. Uh, he was sentenced to consecutive life sentences without opportunity of parole for each murder. Now, in all, uh, in all fairness, the prosecutor reluctantly agreed uh, to the plea deal uh, because investigators and victims' relatives wanted the murders resolved uh, and the cases closed. But if Ridgway wasn't a poster boy for being the worst of the worst, uh, one would be hard pressed to find uh, uh, one who was worse. Ridgway was not, or has not been, and will not be executed. There are currently 39 death penalty jurisdictions in the United States. Um, 37 states, the US government, and the US military. There are 14 non-death penalty jurisdictions, 13 states, and the District of Columbia. Uh, five death penalty jurisdictions have not executed a single, per uh, have not executed a single person since executions uh, resumed in 1977. So for all intents and purposes, there really are 19 uh, non-death penalty jurisdictions in this country. Uh, nearly half of the executing states, um, 16 of them, have executed fewer than 10 people uh, since executions resumed in 1977. Uh, capital punishment is not an integral part of the criminal justice process in these states, uh, but an occasional product of chance, an unpredictable occurrence. Five of these executing states account for two-thirds of all executions since 1976. They are Texas, Virginia, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Florida. Uh, two states account for 45% of all executions, Texas and Virginia. And Texas, Texas alone, accounts for 36% of all post-Furman executions. So indeed, executions in this country are very much localized and uh, essentially a product of unpredictable chance. Now, executions are predominantly a southern phenomenon. More than 80% of executions since 1977 have occurred in the South. In fact, the South has executed more than seven times more people than any other region in the country. Now, there's also a regional variation within states. So, for example, in the state of Florida, a person who commits a capital murder in uh, the panhandle of the state is much more likely to receive the death penalty than is a person who commits 
um, a capital murder in any other of the any other area of the state, and that's true of other states as well. Research shows that greater numbers of death eligible homicides do not increase the over prob overall probability of a death sentence. In other words, the uh, level of homicides in a particular jurisdiction's, uh, jurisdiction does not predict the total number of executions in that jurisdiction. Uh, reasons, uh, I'll talk about reasons for arbitrary application when I talk about miscarriages of justice in just a moment. Another reason for arbitrary application is that the Supreme Court sometimes changes the rules. Uh, for example, in 1987, the court ruled that victim impact statements uh, at the sentencing phase of a capital trial uh, are impermissible. In 1991, the court reversed itself. In 1989, the court ruled that it was permissible to execute 16 and 17 year olds. In 2005, the court reversed itself. Whether or not an offender is death eligible depends on the changing positions of Supreme Court justices. Reason number six. The death penalty is imposed in an unacceptably discriminatory way. The death penalty is reserved almost exclusively for the poor. It's reserved almost exclusively for men. Uh, it's reserved uh, for killers 18 years of age and older. Uh, it is imposed disproportionately on black males. Uh, and it is imposed disproportionately on the killers of white victims, regardless of the race of the offender. Reason number seven. Innocent people are wrongly convicted and sentenced to death. Ooh, I'm running out of time, so I better be quick here. Uh, since 1973, 123 people in 25 states have been released from death row because of evidence of their innocence. Uh, that represents about one death row inmate released for every 8.5 8 that have been executed. Between 1999 and 2006, there has been an average of 6.43 death row inmates released each year because of evidence of their innocence. Why do these miscarriages of justice occur? Again, I've got to be quick here. A shoddy investigation and misconduct by the police, for example, losing, destroying, or manufacturing evidence. Misconduct or malfeasance by crime lab personnel. Eyewitness misidentification and perjury by prosecution witnesses. False confessions. Guilty pleas by innocent defendants. Prosecutor misconduct, for example, withholding exculpatory evidence, suborning perjury, use of improper evidence. Judicial misconduct or error, for example, prejudging the case, incorrectly finding fact, refusing to give certain jury instructions. Bad defense lawyers, that is, inexperienced, unskilled, overworked, lazy, understaffed, less resourceful, underpaid, unprepared, distracted, alcoholic, drug-addicted, <laughs> sleeping through trial lawyers. <laughs> Jury problems, for example, misunderstanding or confusion about sentencing responsibilities, misapprehension of jury instructions, impermissible bias. Reason number eight, innocent people are probably wrongfully executed. Uh, since 1976, in the implementation of super due process, as many as 24 people and likely more may have been executed in air in the United States. That represents about 2% of all executions since 1976. Reason number nine, executions are regularly botched. Uh, since 1976, at least 61 executions have been botched. 
33 lethal injection uh, executions have been botched. Recently, Angel Nieves Diaz's lethal injection execution in Florida was botched. Reason number 10, executions are not necessary to incapacitate. Reason number 11, executions are not necessary for retribution. As I mentioned before, there are 14 jurisdictions without the death penalty. There are 125 countries in the world without the death penalty. And they seem to be able to incapacitate and achieve retribution without the death penalty. Reason number 12, most religious organizations oppose the death penalty. Reason number 13, executions preclude the positive contributions that can be made by convicted capital offenders in prison. Uh, the exa a good example, Stanley Tukey Williams, a uh, San Quentin death row inmate and Crips Street Gang uh, co-founder Stanley Tukey Williams was nominated for the 2001 Nobel Peace Prize. Williams, who was convicted in 1981 for killing four people, was nominated for his series of children's books and his international peace efforts. His latest book, Life in Prison, describes daily life behind bars in San Quentin. It is targeted at sixth graders and intended to keep them out of street gangs. His internet project for street peace links at-risk California and South African youths through email and chat rooms. The project allows these youths to share their experience and transform their lives. In 2005, Williams received a presidential call to service award from President Bush for his more than 4,000 hours of community service. In December 2005, Williams was executed. Reason number 14, a majority of the world's nations have abolished the death penalty in law or practice. 125 nations have abolished the death penalty, only 71 nations retain it. But even among those 71 nations, very few of them actually employ the death penalty. Reason number 15, in Europe the death penalty is viewed as a violation of human rights. Reason number 16, abolition of the death penalty is a requirement for admission into the European Union and the Council of Europe. Reason number 17, all Western industrialized nations except the United States have abolished the death penalty. Reason number 18, a majority of the American public may support the death penalty in theory but most people are ignorant about the way the death penalty is actually administered. What they think they know, moreover, is generally wrong. Reason number 19. Given the option between the death penalty and a meaningful alternative such as LWAP, a plurality of the public prefers the alternative according to a 2006 Gallup poll. Reason number 20. The death penalty diverts scarce resources from the fight against violent crime. I've already noted that earlier. Uh, the money spent on the death penalty could be used, for example, to hire more police officers, probation officers, parole officers, and other criminal justice personnel. It could be used to hire more teachers, provide more day uh, care, uh, provide uh, more homeless shelters and food programs and provide health care to all those without it. Reason number 21, the death penalty does little for the victims of families. It does not, in most cases, bring closure, as many people wrongfully believe. For many co-victims, capital punishment provides neither catharsis, finality, nor closure to their loss. Most co-victims are likely to be insulted because 98 to 90 percent of death eligible offenders are never executed. In the vast majority of criminal homicides, a death sentence is not even sought. 
Thus, many homicide victims, family members, and friends will feel that they and the homicide victim are unworthy and have been devalued by the justice system because the killer of their loved one or friend did not receive the maximum penalty allowed by law. Reason number 22. The death penalty creates enormous hardships and often destroys the families of executed offenders. So in closing, I'd like to ask my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Robert Blecker, why do we need the death penalty? Thank you. <laughs>